afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you uh, for this webinar session this afternoon. Uh, now that businesses, uh, most businesses have reopened, um, today we're going to consider some of the challenges that businesses are facing uh, and hopefully answer some of the questions that have been submitted in advance of the webinar today and those uh, that will be submitted during the call. Our Q&A panel consists of a mix of local regulatory and public safety experts from environmental health, training standards, public health, town centres, fire and police and the local authorities. I'd like to thank uh, our partners at the Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce, Coventry and Warwickshire Growth Hub, Warwickshire Towns Network, the FSB, and the local bids for helping us to promote this event today. Some important housekeeping first, this event will be recorded, so should you remain logged in, uh, we take this as your consent to be uh, recorded. The information provided today is current and correct to the best of our knowledge uh, on Wednesday the 5th of August, so please note this if you're viewing the webinar at a later date. Uh, the format will be as normal, um, the panel will introduce themselves and some key topics, um, key concerns they have at the moment, if they have them, um, followed by uh, some pre-submitted questions which we'll consider and uh, questions then also from uh, chat or um, spoken as we go along. Um, so do please raise your hand uh, as we go along if you if you have any comments or questions. My name is Ian Flynn and I work for the Economy and Skills Service at Warwickshire County Council and I'm the facilitator for this uh, webinar today. I'd like to introduce now our panel uh, and we'll start uh, if that's okay with Daryl. Good afternoon, I'm Daryl Townsend of Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service, Fire Protection Department. Um, we deal with all the fire safety requirements for businesses and non-domestic premises. So if there's any questions on fire safety or any related COVID issues that might relate to fire safety, such as fire exits or routes in and out of a premises, uh, one-way systems and fire doors, uh, I can answer those questions today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daryl. Paul? Good afternoon, I'm Sergeant Paul Calver from Warwickshire Police. Uh, I'm responsible for the harm hub in South Warwickshire, including licensing and other aspects of um, COVID. Uh, just to raise, raise really the fact that obviously it's, it's a very changing picture within Warwickshire and within the legislation that we have to deal with throughout this. Um, so we are trying our best to advise you as best we can on the current situations. Um, and we just ask people that they, they respect um, the legislations that come out uh, and support uh, the authorities in trying to enforce such legislation um, and to reduce the call for service as much as possible. Thank you. OK, thank you, Paul. Uh, Gemma? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gemma Stainthorpe and I work for Public Health based at Warwickshire County Council. So here today just to advise on anything public health related um, as far as I can help today. Thank you. And Lorna? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lorna Hudson. I work for Warwick District Council. Um, the service areas that I'm responsible for include licensing, food safety, health and safety, uh, pollution, pest control, dog control. Um, I think perhaps the key message for me at this stage is um, just contact us if you've got any problems. We're here to help you. Uh, we're only going to flex our regulatory muscles for those businesses which, which are not complying. So um, talk to us. We're here to help. Thank you. And Henry? Yeah, good afternoon, my name is Henry Biddington. I'm a Principal Environmental Health Officer for Rugby Borough Council. Um, my team look at health and safety and food safety, amongst other things. Um, yeah, so my sort of message would be to um, to carry on what you're doing and with your risk assessments, keep reviewing them, making sure you're keeping with your, um, your COVID security within your premises um, and just try to keep the public safe and yourselves and your staff safe. Uh, and carry on doing the sterling work that all the, the businesses have been doing. Uh, and if there are problems, then, then contact us because, as, as Lorna says, we're here to help rather than to. Uh, we'd rather we'd rather help you than get to a situation where where we have to take uh, a more formal approach. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Henry. And our final panellist, Aaron. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aaron Corsi and I'm from the Warwickshire Towns Network, so part of the town centres and tourism team at Warwickshire County Council. Um, I suppose our clear message at the moment is about the keep safe, buying and eating locally, trying to get as many of the businesses to carry on, continue to, to work in a safe manner and encourage your customers back into the town centres and the high streets. Um, it's about being safe, being secure, and keeping your staff and the customers safe. Okay, and yes, a quick a quick um, plug while we, we're talking about um, buying PPE and related equipment. Uh, there's lots of Coventry and Warwickshire businesses that are producing and supplying these products. So if you go to the Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce Recovery Hub uh, or the Find It in Coventry and Warwickshire website. Um, there's lists of, of local suppliers for things like hand sanitizers, face coverings um, and, you know, um, social distancing signage. So um, do please um, shop local, um, buy local where you can. OK, so thank you for your introductions, uh, panellists. Um, we have, as I say, a range of questions today that um, we've had submitted by um, some of our uh, business partners uh, in Warwickshire. So um, perhaps we'll make a start on those. Uh, do please chip in as we go along. You can put a comment in the in the chat or you can raise your hand as we go along. So um, the first topic I thought we'd consider um, is around um, what businesses need to do to facilitate um, the collection of details for test and trace. What what is it that um, that businesses need to do? Does it depend on the on the kind of business? Um, so yeah, I'm happy to take that question, Ian. Um, so with regards to test and trace, then, um, so we're looking for businesses, uh, especially sort of pubs, restaurants, that type of thing, to be collecting names and numbers, um, telephone numbers uh, relating to people who are visiting their premises. Uh, reason being, obviously, the more timely we can react to any potential positive cases uh, that are emerging in the community or in a certain setting, uh, the more quickly the NHS test and trace service can really um, sort of bottom that down and, and stop it from going any further. Um, so really, it's just quite simple. Um, just tell, as I say, names and telephone numbers. Lots of businesses are doing this in different ways. Some might already have pre-booking systems where that information is already stored. Um, some people are sort of handing in pre-written slips and things when they go into businesses or, or um, you know, pubs and restaurants. So it's up to you how you want to do that and how you want to advertise that. Um, just worth mentioning, some people um, won't want to leave their details. Um, and as we've sort of mentioned before, there's only sort of so much that we can all do um, at the moment. And it's not up to you um, really to be enforcing or double checking whether someone's details are correct. And we can only, you know, go as far as we can. Um, but that's the essence of test and trace at the moment. So so it, it's it's full name and a phone number, is that? Yeah, minimum? and you can, to be fair, you even if you're if you're a group of, um, you know, a family or, or perhaps two families, if you're going to eat inside, um, one person's contact details is sufficient as long as anyone in that group can be contacted. Right, great. Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, just to reiterate really what Gemma's just said, we um one of the regular calls we get um, to the police around COVID regulations and guidance is premises are not doing registrations for test and trace um, so you know as Gemma says the business can do as much as they possibly can but they need to make an attempt to actually do it rather than just put it in the too difficult to do box because that's when we are getting the calls uh, when people are not making any attempt whatsoever to do it so we just need to encourage every business to do their best to do the test and trace get the registrations of people coming in um, to prevent those calls coming in and then preventing those visits from one of the authorities to come and see why they're not doing it. Thank you. OK, a couple more hands up, just going in order of those. I think, uh, Aaron, you were first. Yeah, I'd like to come in there. I think from a retailer point of view and from a business support point of view, we can actually be utilising this and the businesses can be actually be using the, the positive spin on, on collecting people's details at this moment 
for all those businesses and the retailers that out there that don't have a, a customer database or don't know who their customers are, this is actually a great way of being COVID secure as well as actually creating your database and creating your customer base, which is which then you can use to advertise and, and actually help your business in the long run. So in actual fact, on the other side, on the flip side of this, there is a positive out of this that you could actually create a a great set of um, chain of sales through COVID-19. Yeah, it's a point, point well made, Aaron. There's lots of businesses turning this turning this terrible time into a, an opportunity, um, and and that's that's another good example. Lorna. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to add um, on top of what Paul said um, at Warwick District Council. We're also getting complaints. Um, but there's the, there's a customer reassurance aspect to this as well. So it, it may seem like it's a, it's hard work to do or it's, you know, fiddly. Um, but customers are coming to us because they feel unsafe. So if you're taking those measures and you're putting in place those procedures, it, it's going to make them feel better about coming into your premises as well. But the bottom line is that it's it's a business's discretion whether or not they, they, they turn away someone who won't give their details. OK, were there any more comments on that or questions from those on the on the call? No, thank you for those uh, for, for that information. So moving on then. Um, we wanted to look today at um, uh, outdoor tables, table licensing. So if you're a business and you've got some space, perhaps you've not used it before um, outside of your premises, um, what would you what would you need to do? Uh, I'll pick this one up here. Um, so as some of you will know and seen on the news, the government's uh, made some temporary changes to the law um, around placing furniture on the highway. Previously, um, it's been administered by Warwick County Council, but it's now come down to the district and boroughs under um, a new act called the Business and Planning Act 2020. And it's introduced this new regime for pavement licenses, which allowed you to um, basically put furniture on the pavement and um, where your customers are able to uh, eat and drink um, food. Um, these changes are going to remain in place until the 30th of September 2021. And as a district, what the different um, councils have been doing, we've been working together to try and get some uh, uni unified procedures in place for you. Um, we're nearly there. Um, and what this means is the application should be the same pretty much um, whatever district you're in. Um, the fees, unfortunately, they're going to be a little bit different because we've all got different overheads, um, but the maximum fee will be reduced from what it currently is with county to £100. Um, the Act basically requires that each application that you would make for this is subject to a public consultation. Uh, this consultation will last for five working days um, and what you would need to do once you've applied to us is actually put a notice up in a prominent place of what it is that you're wanting to do. As part of that application, you're going to have to submit certain documentation. And that's going to be things um, like a plan of where you want to put your table and chairs or, or any other um, street furniture. So you might be wanting to put heaters out, planters, that type of thing. Um, you're going to need to submit um, a location showing the actual locations where you're going to put them and also how much space there's left um, on the highway for people to get past. You, you're not able in the legislation to restrict access to, to any vehicles or on equality issue, anybody who needs who needs a space of the pavement. So we're going to be able to accept applications from the 10th of August. Um, along with that application, sorry, you're also going to have to supply a, a sample of uh, a photograph of the actual furniture that you want to put out on the highway. Um, what are the things there you're going to have to do? Um, we're going to have to spend the first five days consulting um, with, with partners on your application. So that may be the people like the police or it would be County Council um, and also members of the public are going to have opportunities to be able to submit any comments that they've got. 
So after that first five working days, there's then another five working days where we have to determine your application. Um, if in that time we're unable to determine your application, it's deemed as you've got consent. But on the back of that, there's then other things that we're able to do if um, there are problems being caused where we can revoke a license, etc. If you have a look on our website, um, we've also got a link to the government guidance. I would strongly recommend you have a read through that before you even submit an application, because in there you'll see that there's um, mandatory conditions which are national across the board. Everybody in the UK is going to have to comply with those conditions. And you'll also find um, a list of what we've agreed across the county for our local conditions. Um, has anybody got any questions about that? We've got some further comments. Uh, I think, Paul, you were first up with your hand. Yeah, just just really just to reiterate um, some of the things Lorna was saying. Obviously, the police will be consulted on all the applications that come in. Um, and obviously, we will be quite interested in ones where there's alcohol involved uh, in the pavement licenses and things like that. So, you know, we will be looking for people to put certain things in place to prevent alcohol moving out of certain areas and things like that when we're looking at those sort of areas and also just an, another thing really because i know from around the country there has been some strange applications that are coming for pavement licenses and things like that so we just ask people to be realistic of what they're applying for don't be asking to put a table and chair smack bang in the middle of a highway where there's traffic and the roads are open and things like that um, because obviously that will get refused on the grounds of safety and things like that. So let, just make the applications um, sensible. Make sure you've done the measurements as well to make sure you've got those distances for people to pass those areas because we've already seen a couple that are coming through county where they're leaving minimal distance that's not sufficient for things like wheelchairs or, or things like that. Um, so to make sure that, and obviously once you get your licence, look after it because obviously there is a revocation procedure. So once you've got it, look after it, comply with all the conditions that are on it, whether it be the standard ones or bespoke ones for that area, look after it and comply with it. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Henry? Well, yeah, I was just going to reiterate, I think Paul's kind of covered that to, to a certain extent with the, um, in, in the guidance to once you've had your licence, obviously you need to to make sure it's, it's the conditions are followed because there is a, a process where it can be revoked although obviously that is a process we, we can work through with the businesses the other thing um yes the, cons the consultation period will be with also with the, the other environmental health departments are looking at things like noise so if you're in a residential area just like you need to be aware of you know of how you may have impact on residentials and things like that so there's just things you need to consider when you put your application in just to make sure that you've thought about how you're going to have an impact uh, and whilst we, we, we want to encourage businesses to expand there and be able to to act um, to have more capacity so that improve the businesses, we, we also don't want to have a negative impact on on residents or other businesses within within the area. So it's just about sort of behaving responsibly, I suppose, with, within the application and, and once you've got the license in place. So the the application needs to be made to the district or borough council. So that might be North Warwickshire. Borough, it might be Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough, might be Rugby Borough, might be Warwick District Council or Stratford or Avon District Council. Um, if you don't know your um, which local authority your, your business is in, you can um, you can check online. But if you're still not sure, you can email us at uh, business at uh, warwickshire.gov.uk. Um, and I wondered, panel, is if if while you're putting together your application, um, is there somewhere you could go for for advice before you submit that or what would be your suggestion? I was just about to say um, I'll pop a link actually on the chat website for um, where the government guidance is and I think most local authorities are getting some advice up on their own websites as well of what people can do and also what what the different conditions are um, including enclosing the actual area with barriers or planters that type of thing and the measurements that that would need to be done. But for now, I'll pop a link on the on the on the questions. Yeah, and obviously, if you're paying business rates, it's it's the authority that's issuing the business rates bill um, that you need to speak to about uh, about this. OK, thank you. Any any further comments on this at all? 
No, thank you. And, and I see Lorna's added the uh, link there in the in the chat um, column. OK, so um, moving on um, and uh, of course, much, much discussed in the news in recent weeks, um, lock, local lockdowns. Um, we've been asked what the what the process would be, how that would work and um, in the hopefully this won't happen, but but should should that be necessary in, in Warwickshire, what would the process be? OK, so yeah, I'm happy to answer this. Um, as you can sort of see um, from around the country in different situations, there's many different situations that can arise um, which might cause things like local lockdowns or even sort of a wider region, um, etc. Um, so from Warwickshire's perspective, we have a Coventry and Solihull and Warwickshire partnership, um, which is joint up and there is an action plan in place for if um, a lockdown situation were to, to reoccur. Obviously, it's not anything that anybody wants. Um, there are many different levels and triggers um, from looking at the action plan. It could be, for example, things like, um, you know, a cluster within perhaps a business or within, you know, a smaller kind of area would result in, in closures of perhaps premises rather than um, the kind of the wider community as a whole. Um, if things were to, numbers were to perhaps rise within, um, you know, a certain community and you can see clear clusters, then the advice might be different and you might look at sort of, bringing, um, locking down sort of local towns and things like that. Um, and then ultimately, as we've seen in certain areas of the country, if numbers really do start to spiral out of control within certain regions, you know, central government will step in and will will offer that advice um, and and sort of start and put that, that lockdown in place where they think it needs to be. Um, there's lots of things that can trigger it. There's lots of things we're looking out for, our neighbouring areas, seeing what's going on there and how numbers are looking. Um, but ultimately, trying to prevent that from happening. And the best way that we can do that and work together is to really try and maximise this um, test and trace programme um, locally as much as we can. Another bit of advice I'd just sort of like to mention as well is we're asking now businesses to get in contact with us at the County Council, public health team here at the County Council directly if um, two members of staff are tested positive for COVID. So within that situation, normally Public Health England should be contacted immediately and we're asking that our local team is contacted as well. I'll put the email address in, in the little chat bar, but it's phadmin at warwickshire.gov.uk. And the reason being, we'd like to really try to act as quickly as possible when cases do emerge in the local community and really try and get on top of that that more even more quickly than we're trying to do already and by doing that we're really trying to support the local community and local businesses for not going into a future lockdown if we can help it and that is the best way that we can go about this um so again that's just sort of stressing that process as well and i suppose Gemma, it's difficult to say how much warning we would get with i suppose yeah, it's very difficult. We have intelligence teams that monitor the numbers locally every day across all district and boroughs within the county um, and obviously across the, the country as a whole. And it is being watched very, very closely. Um, you know, it, it it's very difficult how quickly sometimes outbreaks and clusters come about very quickly. Um, and it's a case of, of needing to act in appropriate sort of measures as to what the size of the outbreak is and what situations that's occurred in. It's very difficult to predict the future and say what might happen um, and what particular scenarios we might find ourselves in. But all we can do is try and sort of stick to the measures that we've been undertaking so far and try and be as transparent um, with Public Health England and Public Health Warwickshire, local authorities, district and borough representatives as much as possible. And then whoever makes the decision, I guess, whether it's local or national government, they, they would put they would put a news release out through the media. Absolutely. So it, whether it would be, you know, a local level, which may be decided by Coventry and Sally Hall and Warwickshire 
um, DPH is so directors of public health and other partners, whether it's that level, whether it comes from a national um, sort of central point, um, there would be, you know, um, a lot of communications that would be going out. There would be a lot then of further advice and support that we can then offer in those situations. So it's not going to be a sort of this is happening and we're shutting our doors. You know, we'd be here to offer advice and support moving forward and out of that worst case scenario again. Yeah. OK, thank you. Paul, you had your hand up first. <clears throat> yeah, um, just to, again, reiterating what Gemma says, it's again about working with the authorities, particularly public health, when you become aware of issues at your premises and, and spikes and things like that, because I guarantee that we will be aware um, whether the information comes into the police from people that have worked there or from general public, we will be sharing that with public health of the county straight away as soon as we get it. Uh, and they will be aware of it as well. So that it's no point in trying to hide things, thinking businesses are going to be closed down or anything like that. It's purely simply working with the authorities to help prevent the spread and do as what is necessary, which won't always mean closing down businesses or anything, which I'm sure General will, will reiterate. It may be about doing extra uh, health and safety regimes, sanitising or whatever the business, but, it, but don't hide it. Uh, we will find out about it. And also the other thing is really is obviously the county have got a power to close premises under public health um, under the legislation now should there be deemed a risk to public health, which may be because of a, a spike in something where the venue is doing absolutely nothing to try and control it, engage or, or work with the authorities. So the, the message is don't hide it, work with us, talk to the experts, which will be public health, environmental health officers, etc. Uh, but talk to the experts about it. OK, thank you. Several questions here. I think, Henry, you were next. Um, yeah, just to, to reiterate, yeah, the importance, I think I sort of said it at the start of the webinar when I came in, um, you know, is to keep all your measures under review, to keep your risk assessments under review with regard to COVID safety, because there may be some local lockdown situations, but the best thing that businesses can do is to try and follow all of their safety measures. Um, and to ensure that they're reviewing those safety measures to that they're in line with what the current government guidance is and what the current local situation is. So it's just a, a case of staying on top of these things. As I said, the, you know, most of the businesses have done a, a brilliant job of getting themselves open and getting themselves open safely. And now is the time you, you, you can't really relax on that, that, that part of it. You need to continue and carry on doing that because that work is, is, is what is what's going to try and keep people safe. And there, there may be issues outside of your control but if you could do everything within the power as a business to, to make your customers and your staff safe and reduce that transmission risk within your business um, but it's an it's an ongoing piece of work i think there was a lot of effort when everybody reopened to get all this work done but it, it, it is an ongoing piece of work it does need constant review and i think that, that everybody needs to be to be aware of that and just to, to keep on top of those control measures yeah Thanks, Henry. As, as you would in any case when running a business, um, you just need to be even more on it than normal. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I'd just like to come back on Gemma's point there about the support and the county and the districts and boroughs and the parish councils are all working together to continue with that support and look at the, the COVID pandemic from a, a different point of view, from a business point of view. So looking at social media channels and being able to utilise your social media channels. Um, there have been some great examples of businesses across the county that have started to do live um, Facebook selling hours and things like that that are actually engaging with their businesses in a different manner. So it's about sort of thinking about your business and thinking about the high street and what and how you're doing business and how you can benefit from all the, the, the different ways that people are currently shopping. Are they, if you're using online, then actually it creates footfall. Use, utilising social media and increasing your customer base and engaging with your customers and talking with your customers actually increases footfall onto the high street. It, it creates a safe environment for your customers to come to. So actually utilising it in a different manner um, really will help you. And the county and the districts are all working together to continue any digital training and any support. So if any businesses are out there and they're looking for any digital training, the county will hopefully be providing some of that soon. Um, so if you follow us at the, the Warwickshire Towns Network, um, you should see all that information coming up shortly. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Excellent advice. Um, Gemma, sorry to keep you waiting there. 
Hi, yeah, I just wanted to follow up again on, on something that Paul said. So just to, you know, if you do come to us with, with a case or a couple of positive cases, we've had some examples of, of local um, workplaces who've had small outbreaks, etc. It doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that your workplace needs to close. We're just there to help support you with advice for cleaning, with advice for social distancing within the workplace. It doesn't necessarily sort of jump straight to the worst possible case scenario for your business the last thing we really want to do is close is close anybody down and and we'd be focusing on the other measures um, before that would need to happen okay thank you and i would just say if you're if you're tuning in and, and you you just don't know where to go uh, for advice a, a good starting point um, is the the covid secure workplace um, website on the on the county council um, website Perhaps um, Louise, if you could post that in chat, um, that's got lots of, of useful links to, to all our partners today. Um, OK, anything further on that or, or should we move on? So um, face coverings, I'm sure um, you, you've been out and you've seen um, a mixture of, of uh, activity in terms of, of customers um, wearing and not wearing face coverings. Um, what's what's the position of, of businesses in terms of, of enforcing enforcing this? I was in a shop yesterday myself and I was almost um, going to point it out but I, I didn't. Um, but where does the where does the responsibility right lie there? Um, I'm happy to come in to start with you and I'm sure other colleagues will have um, other bits to add. Um, but with regards to face covering, so yes, it's required to be worn in shops and supermarkets at the moment and a further list of premises um, which will come into into action from the 8th of August. Um, so with regards to face coverings, there's two sort of levels of responsibility here. A lot of it is on an individual, um, you know, a, a sense of their own responsibility to, to be doing that out and about in public. And we have a lot of communications out at the moment about keeping, you know, your town safe, keeping Warwickshire safe, etc., which is really important. If you are working within um, a retail environment or any other environment where face coverings are supposed to be worn, um, the thing to remember is we do have a list of people who are exempt from wearing face coverings. Um, that list can be found on our COVID Secure website. I think Louisa hopefully put something up on there. Um, and so it's about being mindful around the fact that there will be some people who will not, um, it will not be appropriate to wear a face covering. Um, some places it is quite difficult because some of these um, issues might be unseen and we have to be really, really mindful and sensitive about that. Um, so it's just being being mindful that whilst you are out and about and you do see most people wearing face coverings, some people won't be. And there, there may well be a really good reason for that. Um, so there are some good exemption messages as well going around at the moment. It's not the responsibility of somebody who works within a retail environment to enforce somebody to wear a face covering. You know that again there are limitations um it relevant signage pointing it out um you know raising it appropriately if necessary is fine but just being really mindful and sensitive that that's not always um the case thank you Gemma. yes and, and you may well see uh, out and about or online the the let's do the right thing campaign um that warwickshire local authorities are are encouraging um, people to to wear a mask um, if they can wash their hands social distance and and isolate self-isolate um, all, all the messages of, of government but it's it's a, a local push around that paul you have your hand up oh yeah i suppose really from a police perspective we need to comment on this really as well obviously a lot of the major stores have already come out publicly on social media etc and said they're not going to be enforcing face coverings in their premises and we don't get too many calls about those big stores from the members of the public we get more of our calls from smaller independent shops corner shops um, hairdressers barbers etc where they're saying people aren't wearing face coverings um, and things like that from a police perspective 
We will attend where there is a deemed and necessary response. There's a, there's a thing we call Thrive, which is about threat, harm, risk, etc. And we will attend where there's a deemed threat or risk involved in the incident. Um, so if someone's been challenged or something can there be you know, abusive or threatening or something like that, then we will attend. On the other calls we get where it's someone calling to say a shop has got people in there without face coverings, I will be totally honest, it, 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 on depending on our demand at that moment in time with higher priority jobs, whether we would attend or not at that moment in time, it is unlikely we would be able to get to the store in the time for the, that person to actually still be in the store. But whether we do or we don't attend, we would still follow the normal process that we've followed throughout the whole of COVID, and that's our four E's approach, um, which is about engagement, encouraging and explaining to people why there's a necessity for face masks and things like that, and that the last resort would be down to enforcement, because obviously there is a fixed penalty, um, part of the offence for face masks, which we don't want to ever get to. We'd rather try and explain to people and encourage people and things like that. So all I'd say to, to the public as such, if you are in a premises and you are challenged by a member of staff regarding face masks and you haven't got it, you've forgotten it or whatever reason, they ask you to leave, then just leave. It's a very simple process. You can come back another time. Um, they're doing it for the good of everybody as such. So let's try and support them in, in that aspect. Um, that, that's really it from a police perspective. Lorna, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I think Paul's touched upon it there really from the public perspective, but from the business perspective and your, em and your employees, um, it, it's not a legal requirement um, for your employees to wear face coverings. Um, and this is really because they, they should be following um, guidance that you've already put forward in your risk assessments, et cetera, and you're following other measures to protect people but I think it's just worth pointing out where where social distancing so where you can't keep those two meters apart or your employer your employees and your customers um, it, it's worth thinking about because that's when you would start to think about well actually is the only measure I can put in place um, for protecting my customers is getting my employees to wear a face mask. So it would all be dependent on what your specific risks are in your workplace. Um, Paul mentioned there about hairdressers and that type of thing. Well, I mean, that that's a close contact service. So we, we'd expect if you haven't got any other measures from a regulatory perspective that you would be looking at having some kind, whether it's a visor, whether it's a face covering, that, that some measures would be put in place for to protect your customers from you, bearing in mind that a face mask doesn't protect you, it protects the people around you. Yeah. And it's, I, I'm, I'm sure most people will have been out to have their hair cut um, and that the new guidance will be very important because um, the process I think will be slightly different so there's a, a list of different sectors I think Gemma isn't there um, with, with changes so um, we, we, we businesses may need to review their, their processes in light of that and, and people obviously need to modify their behaviour too. Aaron sorry if you quickly hand up. I was just going to quickly come in there the um, the links that are on the website about face coverings there was actually some downloadables on there so that customers can actually download a postcard or even a, a, a picture that goes on their phone that states that I'm I'm exempt from wearing a face covering so there's actually some really little there's three little things on there that people can download so if they don't want to have that confrontation as they go into a shop they can show their badge in fact I think there's even badges so you can print out a badge um, a mobile phone picture or a or a poster, a little postcard they can have. So that will ease that as well for, for businesses. So businesses can support that as well by pointing customers to it. Uh, this this might thank you, Aaron. This 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 might sound a little light hearted, but I did see somebody yesterday in a shop um, covering their 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 face, covering their, their mouth and nose with a handkerchief. And I've seen bandanas and all kinds of things. It, is that is that a grey area, Gemma? Or um, that... with regards to the handkerchief, do you mean holding it on with their hand? Literally holding on a handkerchief. Right. Um, um, okay, so so with regards to to that, that's not really um, no, that's not going to sort of offer the protection that you'd be looking for. Mainly because if you've got your hand sort of 
going through the handkerchief and, and all around that's really maximizing that hand to face contact which is, is quite high risk so that that wouldn't be um, appropriate however um, there are other other ways that people are using face coverings scarves etc as long as it is a cloth covering and it's covering the nose and the mouth and it's secured um, and you're not kind of fiddling with it in the way that you've just dis described um, then then it's equally um, as beneficial yeah okay thank you while we're talking about um face coverings uh we we have been asked if any of the local authorities are going to be providing businesses with with face coverings um we we're not we're not planning to um, although there may be some um, surplus uh, face coverings that the nhs have that they can't make use of because they're not medical grade um, and if, if those do become available, then, then we will try and pass those out to the voluntary sector and to um, priority micro and small businesses. But th there will be a limited amount of these and um, clearly they're not going to touch every business. But, but, you know, we will try and work with bids and other local partners to identify, um, you know, key key sectors that, that could benefit most from that. But um, when that when and if that becomes available then then um, we'll share that on social media and, and our, our websites um, Daryl you, you have your hand up yes I just wondered if it was worth commenting on um, how to wear uh, the face coverings because I have seen quite a few uh, like you mentioned about handkerchiefs and so on um, where they're only covering their mouths or they've got around their necks so um, Fire and rescue service are used to wearing PPE probably more than some other sectors. So I just thought I'd comment on that. I've got one here. Um, I have just got the straps across the front because I'm not going to try and stretch it over the top of here and, and knock my um, uh, microphone off. But the masks should be worn over the face. And I don't know if you can still hear me over the face and mouth tucked under the chin and then the nose bridge um, pinched down. If they're like that, they're not doing anybody any good, you or anybody else, because because your nose is still transmitting whatever you're breathing in and out. Um, and also, if you've got any kind of contamination, if you've touched your face, which one or two of us have done today and I'm terrible at, um, I, t I tend to sit like this. So if I haven't washed my hands recently, um, I'm touching my neck. If I've then put my mask under my neck, I've now transmitted it to the inside of the mask. Uh, and this is a disposable one, by the way, so this is going soon. Um, so on and off the face all the time or backwards and forwards with it and under the face or on top of the hair, you're just adding contaminants to the inside of the mask. So it's put it on in a clean environment, put the head straps over, get comfortable, pinch the nose down, but make sure it covers the whole of the face and not just part of the face. Okay, excellent. And uh, a second career is a, a, in modeling, um, Daryl, perhaps uh, awaits. Unlikely, uh, but thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, we, we have had a question from um, uh, in the chat section about um, support for mental health for the um, for those working in retail and hospitality. Um, now there is a, a project um, that the County Council and its partners is working on around emotional well-being support. Um, we haven't made a, a formal announcement about that, but that support we hope will be available from September. So. Um, if you want to contact us um, specifically about that, you can email the business at warwickshire.gov.uk um, and we can we can note your details. Um, but otherwise, uh, look out for information in the coming weeks um, uh, on our websites and, and social media. And that will be a, a emotional well-being support targeted at, um, at, at the retail, um, hospitality, town centre, micro businesses. Thank you. Um, Gemma, do you have your hand up still? Yes, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to um, come in on that as well, Ian. Um, so on our on our website, which Louise has put a link to um, the coronavirus back to work guidance for Warwickshire, um, there is a wealth of mental health um, and emotional well-being links on that website already um, with, with an array of services that are already available to to any residents in Warwickshire. Um, so whilst we're sort of waiting for the other bespoke service to become available, um, please do direct people to those really valuable um, helplines and services. 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. That's an excellent point. Yes, don't don't don't, uh, don't wait for that. Do do use what's uh, what's already available. Um, don't put it off. Thank you. Um, so, um, one question we had around um, the need for for the provision of hand sanitizer in in retail premises. So some or well, most seem to have it. Um, some don't. Is it is it an issue if they don't? Um, yeah, I'm happy to come in on that one. And um, so with regards to hand sanitizer, it is a really, really important part, I think, of any um, business in any setting at the moment. Um, it's a really brilliant way to ensure if people are, are re requested to use the hand sanitizer on entry to any business um, and on exit as well, it's a really, really important tool that you can use to almost reassure yourselves, other customers, etc., that people coming in um, have, have clean hands, um, which is, is a really, really important part of the battle here. Um, so I think it's I think it's a really, really valuable um priceless thing to have in place at the moment i'm sure other colleagues will have other comments to make yeah i, I was surprised that not, uh, a certain national retailer um i was in yesterday didn't have any hand sanitizer i was, I was surprised um but it, it's good practice i i, I guess it's not absolutely mandatory. yeah yeah um henry i think you were first up well, yeah, just to add on, yeah, I think it's it, it absolutely good practice for for you to give that um, option for your customers and to ask them to do so. I think many businesses that be part of their COVID secure risk assessment is how they uh, prevent the transmission of of, um, of COVID within their business. And one of the, the key ways of doing that, one of the controls as part of that risk assessment would be to have the hand sanitizer stations at the front of the, uh, the premises. Um, so often it will be be incorporated in part of your risk assessment anyway. So yes, uh, a very, very good thing to do and highly recommended as part of your risk assessment and part of your control measures. Thanks, Henry. Um, Lorna? Um, yeah, it just links on to what Henry's just said, really. Um, just it's a reminder or just letting people know that the government have produced um, uh, a raft of business guides which, which cover a whole range of different types of work. Um, and part of that, they've produced a document which is called Five Steps to Working Safely. Um, the first step is carrying out the COVID risk assessment that, that we've all been talking about. But the second step is um, developing um, robust cleaning, hand washing and, and hygiene procedures. And, and, and it actually states in the guidance, um, providing hand sanitizer around the workplace in addition to washrooms is, is really good practice. Um, so yeah, ha have a look at them. I can I can put a link to them on on the chat site as well. There. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that? Okay. So do do review the the chat and the links that that have been included there. Um, another topic that we've been asked about. Um, today about for this this webinar today was around um, the availability of discretionary grants um, whether there are any of those still left and what what's the process so um, just to give you uh, a headline uh, the government um, as you probably know allocated um, uh, billions of pounds to for local authorities to to pass on to their local businesses um, and Warwickshire local authorities have allocated 91% of um, the funding made available. Uh, the national average is um, nearer 85 or 86, so uh, there's good performance locally, um, and that's uh, 112 million pounds of, of discretionary grants. Um, there is some money still available um, if you're a business and you 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 think you might be eligible. Um, but there's different different deadlining deadlines depending on which local authority. So um, uh, I would suggest if you if you're not sure to go to the the Growth Hub website, um, uh, the Coventry Warwickshire Growth Hub website, um, which will direct you to the to the right site, um, depending on which local authority you come under. Um, also, Warwickshire is allocating um, four million pounds uh, to aid business recovery. Um, through through various uh, routes, um, 
and we're also um, increasing support for retail, tourism and hospitality businesses um, and focusing some of our um, specialist advisor support um, for those sectors. Um, and there will be grants, um, not for PPE um, to purchase, but, but for businesses needing support to repurpose or pivot the business. So um, buying new equipment or improving their website, um, these kind of these kind of things. Um, and we understand there's further support coming from uh, grants from the government um, by the growth hubs to support with the tourism sector and also some help with with specialist advice. Um, but as always, um, if you keep checking social media, check our website, you've got the link or check um, the Coventry Warwickshire Growth Hub website and um, all of the information will be will be there. Um, getting towards the end of our session today, um, I wondered if there were any other questions from our guests on the call today. Um, something we, we've not touched on, Aaron, perhaps it's a good time to talk about um, some of the, the programmes that, that we're doing to encourage people to to buy local and shop local. Absolutely, yeah, I suppose hopefully many businesses have seen through their town champions or the districts and boroughs and the town councils, we've currently got the hashtag buy local campaign running. So we've there's many videos for each town that have gone out um, happy shopkeepers and, and retail businesses and service industries waving at the doors to say, look, we're open. So I think about on average, about 85 percent of the high street and the town centre businesses are open at the moment. So it's a, a campaign to get the awareness out there that the businesses are open. It's a different it's a different kettle of fish at the moment. Retail isn't what it was six months ago, and it's about being safe, taking a time when you're out there planning more time in the day to go and visit the town centre, etc. Um, so those those videos are out there. Um, we've had, I think there's about 150 businesses across the county that have been featured so far. Um, and we've got a lot more videos that have been sent to us. So we're hoping to be able to create further videos and more videos on that and get them out there. Um, so yeah, there's that one campaign. And and again, it, it sort of bolsters the, the Eat Out to Help Out campaign as well, and as well as the Wear It for Warwickshire campaign uh, for, for face coverings. Okay, thanks for that. Some supportive comments in, in the chat there. Um, for, uh, oh, for those Ian, sorry, can I just come in briefly uh, on discretionary grants? I think some of them are actually quite near the end of their application phases. So I know, for instance, some of them are the 9th of August, the 10th of August, etc. So if there are any businesses out there um, and you're thinking about it, um, it, you need to get your skates on because I do believe some of the individual boroughs and districts and boroughs are closing soon for any yeah. phases they've currently got open on the websites. That's right. North Warwickshire, I think, closes tomorrow. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's various dates. I think rugby might be the 9th, I think. That's right. Warwick uh, the 14th. So they're all very close. And then Eton is the 10th okay. um, and I, th I think Stratford may have already allocated all of its discretionary so. bonds. Yeah, but obviously if you're not sure, check check your district or borough website or, or go via the growth hub. But um, yeah, you may be watching this in two weeks time and uh, of course it will be, be too late then. So um, so some positives today and, and lots of work for us all to do as 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 businesses and, and as local authorities and, and regulators and public health colleagues, um, public safety. So um, just keep on the good work and um, we will avoid any lockdown issues, hopefully in the in the Warwickshire, Solihull, Coventry area. Uh, some fingers crossed there. Um, anything else anyone wants to add? No. I suppose it's just about being proactive, prevention, sanitise your hands and just be positive and, and have that that attitude that we, if we don't go into lockdown, it's because we've been preventative. We've, we've done everything that we should be doing and we, we're covering our faces. That's, that's what it's about. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much all for um, for joining us today. Um, 
some great um, ideas and advice. Um, thank you for, for those questions that were submitted. Um, we'll leave you with some information at the end of the, the webinar, uh, some useful links, and that will that will take you to, to further information and advice. And if there's anything you wanted to raise specifically with anyone on the panel today, you can email us at business at warwickshire.gov.uk. This webinar will be made available um, on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, we'll, we'll push it out on social media um, and you'll find it on our website. So do please share it with your, um, your colleagues and, and friends if you think it's useful to them. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and uh, good luck. <laughs>